If you wanted to have the latest cutting edge technology in your car in 2007, you wouldn't buy a BMW 7 Series or a Mercedes S-Class. You'd own a 2008 Ford Focus with Sync. It was the crowning achievement of Microsoft's automotive team, a device that plays music from media players and supports hands-free phone calls. It was revolutionary at the time and was included in over 1 million vehicles. But it almost never happened. It was the last roll of the dice from a team that had spent years in the wilderness trying to break into the car market. This is the Ford Sync story. The Microsoft Automotive team had been formed in 1995 as part of Microsoft's vision to expand Windows beyond the PC. Instead of using Windows 95, the team picked Windows CE, a smaller version of Windows used for consumer devices. It was first used in the handheld PC and palm-sized PC, a forerunner of the pocket PC that would compete with the Palm Pilot. The team had a hard time engaging with car companies, quickly finding that they weren't interested in Microsoft having such a big sway over their cars. The team managed to strike a deal with Clarion to create an aftermarket device, the Auto PC, which was released at the Consumer Electronics Show in January 1998. This device would have a simple color screen and would respond to 200 speech commands, along with using text-to-speech to speak information back to the driver. It had an AM-FM radio, CD, navigation and address book capabilities but its phone integration was limited as Bluetooth hadn't yet come along. The device was expensive, $1,800 even before the navigation system was added. The device was a failure, but it didn't stop Clarin from releasing a second version, the Joyride, which had a similar set of features but also failed. Microsoft realized it wasn't going to sell many devices by just targeting aftermarket car stereo manufacturers, so they decided to focus on system integrators. Companies like Bosch who built hardware for car companies. Car stereos at this time used simple 4-bit processors that had less power than the home computers of the 1980s. System integrators were being pressured to create more complex devices that would include GPS navigation. This required a new operating system that Microsoft hoped to fill with Windows CE for automotive. There was some limited success from this, with Delphi releasing the Truck PC along with other low volume products. Some device makers had already used the base Windows CE operating system to create in-car entertainment systems, but hadn't used the additional code that the automotive team had produced. Microsoft started a relationship with Bosch to sell their operating system to car makers, but this led to few extra sales. The team's morale was getting low and revenue was barely enough to justify the team's existence. They'd been around for six years without much to show for it. The joke that their product would blue screen and make people crash was wearing thin. Around this time, the automotive team started experimenting with more advanced speech technology and media playback. MP3 media players were starting to become popular. Microsoft's product could catalogue the songs on these devices, allowing the user to control them using just their voice. At the same time, Bluetooth phones were emerging, and hands-free voice technology would be a boon in the car. Microsoft Automotive's sales team started pitching the new product to anyone who would listen. Management pitched in to help, with Bill Gates chauffeuring prospective clients around with test hardware in the back. General Motors showed interest, but it overlapped with the OnStar product that they were heavily invested in. Talk started with Daimler-Benz, who owned Chrysler, and although both parties kept talking for a few months, this amounted to nothing. With no real progress, the team was scaled back, and there was a good chance it would be shut down altogether. At the last hour, the automotive team secured a deal with Fiat to produce a simple product that would allow media players to work in the car, 
with Bluetooth hands-free calling. Work began in 2003 and it was announced in 2004. The device would support a plethora of disparate MP3 media players and USB memory sticks that were on the market at the time. The idea of supporting devices through USB was controversial. Some at Fiat didn't want to include the extra hardware to support it when they thought it wouldn't be widely used. Remember, this was a time before the iPod had become a success and MP3 media player adoption wasn't high. The only user interface Fiat could offer was a simple one-line display and a few buttons. With necessity being the mother of invention, the team leaned heavily on their speech interface to interact with the driver. The driver could choose to play music based on artist, album, song or genre with just their voice. This advanced speech technology came from a company called Scansoft and allowed for almost any word to be spoken by anyone. Quite a revolutionary thing at the time and not something seen on a small consumer device. This new product, called Blue and Me by Fiat, would be the first in-car device to offer this kind of speech technology and would give Fiat's vehicles a real competitive edge. Microsoft Automotive had a dedicated hardware team that had been producing reference hardware since it began and they produced an inexpensive device that could support the features Fiat wanted. Microsoft looked at many companies to build the hardware but Fiat pushed heavily to use its Magneti Morelli hardware division. The software was initially created in Fiat's mother tongue, Italian. This meant the Microsoft US-based team had to learn a lot of Italian speech commands as they got the product ready to ship. Microsoft used outside firms to localize to other European languages, but found the translations didn't have the colloquial expressions that native speakers used. So the team ended up localizing it themselves, hey. leveraging anyone who spoke a language that ah. they needed. As the device was readied for release, the team got some good news. They found it was running 30% slower for no good reason, meaning that overnight, Blue and Me got a 30% speed boost, suddenly making it a snappy device. Some on the team still wonder if someone had slowed the software down on purpose so it would run much faster on release. Fiat would launch the product at the Geneva Auto Show in 2006 on just a few cars to start with. They found it was a big hit that was a relatively inexpensive upgrade and provided a lot of value. But getting Blue and Me released took its toll on the team, with many evenings and weekends sacrificed to make the release date. This was a make or break product. At launch, the new Microsoft team leader would announce, we'll never put you through this again. Although Fiat was going well, sales were initially slow. And to be profitable, Microsoft needed more car companies to take an interest. General Motors had invested heavily in OnStar, which was essentially a phone in the car that customers could use to call a real person to help them in emergencies but also for concierge services like navigation, vehicle location, and diagnostics. This was an expensive service for GM to maintain, and there was evidence that the uptake rate wasn't good. There are no secrets in the car industry. Ford were aware of the Fiat project and its potential. Again, there are no secrets in the car industry. They wanted something as a reaction to OnStar, even though it had been launched almost a decade earlier. But more importantly, they wanted something that would help with impending driver distraction legislation that would mandate hands-free phone calls. Apple's iPod was becoming a global sensation and customers wanted to use these devices in Ford vehicles. Something like Fiat's Blue and Me seemed like a perfect product and it could include OnStar-like features for a much cheaper price. For Microsoft, the Fiat project was critical as Ford wouldn't have noticed Microsoft if not for Blue and Me. Both Microsoft and Ford were keen to make the deal and started negotiations. Ford were used to a one-sided relationship with their suppliers. They said jump and the supplier said how high. This made contract negotiations difficult as originally Ford wanted to own all the technology outright. 
This was a non-starter for Microsoft who wanted to sell their software to other car companies, but in the end a workable deal was threshed out. The development and cooperation agreement ran to over 100 pages, and this was just a warm-up to the main agreement. One of the big hurdles was the rules over coding and testing. Ford had strict guidelines around this, but as you can imagine, Microsoft felt they knew one or two things about coding and testing. Microsoft were required to write a reason why they wouldn't follow each of Ford's best practices. This became an exercise in finding hundreds of ways of writing, we're Microsoft and we understand software development. To Ford's credit, they trusted Microsoft and were keen to support them, even though they were under intense pressure from their management to have Microsoft toe the line. Indeed, both Microsoft and Ford came up with ideas for the new device, although Microsoft had to turn them into workable features. Although always keen to please, Microsoft also pushed back hard when ideas were unworkable or would put the project dates at risk. It ended up being a good working relationship. Microsoft learned to hit hard ship dates and learned the importance of getting a product right first time. Car companies didn't like expensive recalls. Microsoft developed an elegant hardware design, costing an estimated $28. This is especially impressive given that it used more expensive automotive grade components that can withstand higher temperature ranges. Cars need to survive Arctic winters and Death Valley summers. Motorola's automotive division won the hardware contract but was bought almost immediately by Continental. This meant some of the existing agreements had to be renegotiated and Microsoft and Continental found themselves negotiating late into the night with strict instructions not to come out of the room until the contract was agreed. Microsoft had to take the specific Fiat implementation and turn it into a more generic platform that would work not only with Ford's vehicles, but potentially with other manufacturers' cars. Some new Ford features were included in new versions of Fiat's Blue and Me product, like Apple iPod support but Ford had negotiated a period of exclusivity around many of Sync's features. One innovative feature was the device was upgradable, although there were hard discussions between Ford and Microsoft as to who would pay for this and how Ford technicians would be trained. In-car entertainment systems at this time were essentially set in stone as soon as they were driven off the forecourt. Both Blue and Me and Sync were designed to be upgraded when the customer came in for a service. This was done partly out of necessity. There were always newer MP3 players and phones, and updates were needed to maintain compatibility. Updates would create great customer loyalty, plus provide a reason to pay for an official service. It laid the groundwork for the over-the-air upgrade some new cars receive today. But in these pre-smartphone days, the idea that a device would continually improve was a novel concept. Sync sent simple text messages as well as reading them back to you. Microsoft added new Bluetooth features like access to phone numbers and music playback. To ensure good compatibility, the team had over 1,500 phones and media players in their labs, all of which had to be regularly tested. It was turning into a mammoth testing effort, but this was part of the reason for its success. It just worked, with whatever phone or media player you happen to own. As the deadline loomed, the team again got to see less and less of their families. Those words, we'll never put you through this again, were starting to sound hollow, but there was real excitement that Sync was going to be something special. Like Fiat, Ford only targeted this new device to a couple of vehicles, such as the 2008 Ford Focus. But four different radio and CD modules had to be supported, each with their own idiosyncrasies. Buttons would work differently, and displays would require different text as some would have one line and some three lines. Ford Sync was announced by Microsoft and Ford CEOs Steve Barmer and Alan Mulally, both good friends, on January the 8th, 2007. The following day, the iPhone launched, a product that was going to heavily impact Microsoft Automotive's and Sync's future. 
Sync was launched later that year, selling at $395, or about £199, and it was almost immediately a big hit. Customers were buying Fords over competitors' cars purely because of Sync. Ford moved quickly to add it to its other car lines, which meant more work with more button layouts, more CD and radio modules, and more display layouts. Ford found that cars with Sync had a significantly higher resale value, a fact they were happy to tell future customers. It was eventually included in most Ford vehicles around the globe. Almost every manager at Ford and Microsoft started taking credit for it. Sync was extended to support many more OnStar-like features, such as calling emergency services in case of an accident, getting a vehicle health report, hearing weather reports or sports scores, and getting turn-by-turn -turn directions. Microsoft sold their solution to Kia to be sold under the Uvo branding, and Microsoft had success selling their generic automotive operating system well into 2015. In 2012 alone, it's estimated Microsoft Automotive shipped in 13 million cars, and approximately one-third of all high-end in-car audio systems were powered by it in 2013. But there were to be no more big deals with individual car companies. Microsoft had pitched it to most of them already, and competitors' products were catching up fast. Ford had a period of exclusivity on certain features that somewhat tied Microsoft's hands. It was also a lot of work to go with the Microsoft solution. Both Fiat and Ford's projects had taken multiple years and required heavy investment to integrate into cars. Microsoft investigated integrating Sync's technology into satnavs or in-car GPS devices, a class of device that was becoming very popular. Microsoft felt that they could get new features out faster in consumer devices than the multiple years it took with car manufacturers. But sales weren't the big hit that the team had hoped for. With the recession of 2009 and a management reorganization, the team was reduced and there was a focus towards software services which car companies weren't interested in. As we'll see in a future video, unraveling the My Ford Touch debacle would take up several years of the team's time. The Microsoft team are understandably very proud of what was achieved with Sync, and many have fun memories of it. When the one millionth unit was shipped, Ford came out to Microsoft's offices in Seattle to celebrate. It's estimated that Sync has shipped in over 15 million vehicles, and will continue to be sold until at least 2021. Cars have moved on to include large touchscreens, and smartphones provide many of these features through Apple's CarPlay and Android Auto. Sync was upgraded to My Ford Touch and Sync V3, but those are stories for another very interesting video. If you like these videos and want to get early access to new videos, or appear in the credits like these fine people, consider supporting me using the Patreon link below, and hit the subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.